Welcome, everyone, to the 18th annual John Howard Burst Jr. Memorial Lecture. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Libraries here, and I'd like to thank you all so much for coming today. This is a great turnout. Uh, this evening's Memorial Lecture, along with the exhibition that's currently mounted in the library's exhibit cases, uh, make up the University Library's John Howard Burst Jr. program. The program celebrates a milestone anniversary of the publication of an important work of literature. This year's selection, Soul on Ice, by Eldridge Cleaver, is celebrating its 50th year and was selected by the Burst Committee, a group of Roger Williams University faculty, staff, and students chaired by Professor Adam Braver, our library program director. I'd like to especially thank Jennifer Murphy, whose father, Robert Blaze, made a gift to the university 18 years ago um, to establish the annual Burst Lecture, Exhibition, and Book Fund. Can you stand, Jennifer? Just Give a wave. <laughs> the donation supports this evening's keynote speaker, Kathleen Cleaver, who you'll meet in a minute. And Professor Adam Braver will introduce her after, after me. Um, the donation also supports travel for Christine Fagan, our collection management librarian, who's right here. Um, and she's also curator of the exhibition, along with two Burst student fellows to the library that holds the archival collections of the book that is chosen. And finally, the Burst donation supports the purchase of books for the library related to the book that we are celebrating. The University Honor, Honors Program partners with the committee to identify the two student fellows and helps to support their travel as well. This year, Christine traveled with Burst, um, Burst fellows Brett Lauder and Sam Munhall. Are they here? Raise your hands. Yep. <laughs> to the Bancroft Library at University of California, Berkeley. For those of you who have not yet seen the exhibition, Brett and Sam will be standing there after this lecture, and please um, avail yourself of the exhibition and ask them any questions that you like about um, they were assistants to Christine in putting the exhibition together. And now I'd like to introduce Professor Adam Braver, who will introduce our speaker. <laughs> Coming out. The key purpose of the Burst Memorial Program is to honor and engage with a book that is, has been considered to be an important work. But what makes an important work? Is it name recognition? Once having been part of the cultural sphere, a totem of sorts? In fact, I'll submit what gives a book its import are the ideas contained between the covers, and perhaps most importantly, ideas that challenge, question, confuse, and engage, all without necessarily providing the definitive answer, but maybe providing an answer, and at that, an ever-changing answer that is relative to time and place and individual. In other words, a work of lasting significance is one that continues to challenge our thinking and prompts us to reevaluate our beliefs and revisit our understandings, sometimes ultimately confirming them and more often than not, completely throwing us into disarray. This year's book is no exception. 50 years after its publication, Soul on Ice continues to provoke, to prod, to question, to enrage, to demand, and to incite. And why? Because looking back 50 years later, for many it seems as though they've walked a long circle only to end up at the same starting point. But I, of course, speak from a distance. For Kathleen Cleaver, it is not a history, and not a theory, and not a case study. For Kathleen Cleaver, this was and is her life. In her early 20s, a student at Barnard, and in some respects following in her father's footsteps, she found herself at the center of a movement, one that not only sought to right over two centuries of injustice, but part of a movement that believed it would right over two centuries of injustice. Married to Eldridge Cleaver, at the center of the Black Panthers and the Black Power movement, Kathleen's life forever changed, placing her among some of the great minds of the civil rights struggle, and as witness and participant to the highs and lows of the struggle, of which she will talk about today. In her, 30, in her 30s, after years of exile in Algeria and France, and then re-entry into the US, Kathleen went to Yale to finish her degree, 
and subsequently got her law degree at Yale. She currently teaches in the law school at Emory. In choosing Soul on Ice for this year's selection, the Burst Committee understood it was wading into areas that spark debate and controversy and reaction and discussion. A book the committee thought perfect for a university environment where difficult and complex topics can be engaged in through reason, logic, evidence, and a little helping of passion. We are pleased to have Kathleen Cleaver here to help us understand her perspective and experience of those times and perhaps to help us better understand our own times. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much. I had a little pause. I'm discussing this complex technology of trying to show photographs. Uh, I selected them out of a huge, huge collection of photographs I have. I mean, probably there's a thousand. And I have an archivist, archival project going on. And one of the photographers, I asked him to come to my house and I said, I'm, I want some pictures. And I picked out the pictures. And he took photographs of them and made something so I can show them to you. But I really don't know how it works properly. So I have, in fact, I lost the flash drive for a minute. So um, this particular picture is the earliest. So uh, maybe I can stop it after, because you've seen this. This is a picture of my father being sworn in. That's the US flag. And LBJ was president. And that's him. And we're in Washington. And he's being sworn in for the next position that he's going to take in the United States Foreign Service. And I don't really know what that is, but I'm about 18. So that means I'm just now starting college, and I think they went to live somewhere in West Africa. I, I had lived with my family in West Africa, and then it was time for me to stop traveling and go to college. And so I think this is about 1960, well, whatever. Um, but the other thing I want to mention, and this is my little snarky sense of humor, there's a photograph there of LBJ, and I was a visiting faculty one semester at the University of Texas. So I took that picture with me and put it in my office, because that's a little picture of LBJ. It was a very big guy in Texas. <laughs> but anyway, um, so um, we don't need to keep looking at this one. If we click something, will it go away and we can do the next one? Yeah. Uh, okay. But I don't want it the next picture. I just want a blank screen, and I want to bring up uh, the pictures la later. Oh. Okay, well, we're just gonna have to look at this for a while. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to talk, what I would like to talk about is modeling the world that we wanna live in. That's what we saw. I didn't even know what modeling meant when I was out there, we were going to change the world. But we had visions as teenagers, as activists. I was in high school when the Albany students, the students, the high school girls in Albany challenged segregation got arrested, and I saw a picture of them in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and they were in the back of a paddy wagon singing, and they were being hauled off to jail. And I said, what kind of people? Look at them, they're teenagers, they were high school girls, so was I. They were in Albany, Georgia, and if you know anything about Albany, Georgia, it is a racist stronghold. I mean, it still is in a way. Uh, and so I was so impressed, and I was, enthralled ex back by then. And so one of my friends, I was at a boarding school in Georgetown, George, called George School in Pennsylvania because my parents were in Africa and the first time they went to Africa, I took correspondence course classes. And the second time I didn't take any classes, I thought that was wonderful. But um, they said, you need to go back to school. So I was in boarding school while they were in Africa and the Albany movement broke out and it actually, probably stimulated my involvement in the civil rights movement because one student named uh, Wanda said, oh, we should support the students in Albany who are in jail and we should have a sympathy fast in support of them. And then another student who I didn't particularly like that well, he put up a note and he said, that's not a good idea. We should find something more cooperative to do. I said, what? I was livid. First of all, I admired, I admired the girls who risked their life. What I didn't know, I knew they were arrested. What I didn't know is they took them out to a former prisoner of war camp out in the woods and left them there. I mean, that's, 
Yes, yes. And I read the story about that when I was in my 50s or 60s. So people didn't know that. This is, abu this is atrocious abuse. And I met one of the women actually in the civil rights gathering many years later who had actually been in that camp. And so these are survivors of essentially torture. But, um, so I was someone who wanted to, as I was growing up, my parents were, had been activists. My mother was in some organization called Southern Negro Youth Congress. My father was in uh, uh, movement to put an end to the all-white primary in Texas. And what people might not understand is these are life, you're threatening your life if you're trying to put an end to all-white primaries in Texas. And um, my mother was uh, in something called Southern Negro Youth Congress, which was um, infiltrated, as I said, by communists. And her, she had friends who were communists. In fact, one of her men that she grew up with in Richmond, Virginia, some of you who are communists, if you're a communist, you've heard of James Jackson. How many people know who James Jackson is? One. Well, you're not a communist, but he was. Yeah. He was. Because you've got a tie and you teach here. <laughs> or to cover. But it, it, I'm sorry. But um, uh, I don't know. But so my mother was in an organization called Southern Negro Youth Congress, and her neighbor and close friend who was madly in love with her was James Jackson, who, if you know anything about the Communist Party, he's an American Communist Party member. Well, her father was a Baptist preacher, and there was no way in the world she was going to marry communist. So James Jackson found another lady who kind of looked like my mother who married, married her, and my mother <laughs> married somebody else. But James, he was always like an uncle. He was always around. They grew up together. So in my life, this movement of activism, communists, radicals. My father was doing rural community development. His first job, I think, was in Tennessee in the TVA uh, pr program to, to, to uh, improve the Tennessee Valley. And so I was in this environment where people devoted their time, devoted their intelligence to social justice and social change. And I just recently started talking about this, but my mother was actually brilliant. She had a master's degree in mathematics from the University of Michigan at the age of 16. So I had been hearing this story, and I said, maybe they made it up. Let me check. So I went into the records of the University of Michigan for the year that she got that degree, and there was her name, Juhat Johnson. Matt says, it's true, it's true. So I have brilliant parents, so I guess I do better than many because of the way I was brought up. And the fact that I became an only child. My parents had two children, me and my brother, but my brother died when he was about... 11 of childhood leukemia. They didn't know what it was. And so I became an only child. So I became the focus of my parents' attention. Uh, and so I got to do a lot of things and say things that probably I might not have if they had more attention. Like, I don't want to go back to college. I want to go in the movement. Why don't you send me the money you pay Barnard? And I'll get a real education. <laughs> my father said, I'll do it for a year. So when I was in college, my father agreed that I could go into the student-run violent coordinating committee and work, and they had no money because of Stokely Carmichael and Black Power and Lerat Brown and all those wonderful activists who I admired and the Southerners hated, and uh, it was dangerous. It was dangerous, uh, but <clears throat> so I would say I have devoted many, many years and countless hours to mobilizations, to movements, and other programs that have modeled and ways that we want to change and how we could create the world we want to live in, my generation and my parents' generation wanted to live in. Uh, what I see as needed is we had to seize the moment. And we need now. That, like in the light of all this long legacy and history that going back to the, like the 1930s and bringing up to now, uh, we need to refresh our commitments. When I say we, that's people who want to see social justice, who want to see fundamental change, and who are willing to invest in it. And everybody doesn't have to do it, uh, but everybody can help, even if you're not on the front line, because the people on the front line want to be there. Nobody can force them there. To somebody like John Lewis, nobody forced him to be on the front line, but that's where he wanted to be. Um, and he's lucky to be alive, because everybody that worked in the Selma movement didn't make it. Uh, so I think what we, is needed is 
we have to be able to refresh the commitments we have and to resist the cultural and political and economic oppression that's going on within our communities and resume active struggle. Now that's a tall order, but there's lots and lots of 18 and 19 and 20 year olds in this country and they're the ones that have the energy to do it. What they might not have is the inspiration, but that's what we had. We had the inspiration and we had an era in which people were dying on a regular basis. This is Vietnam. People were saying, hell no, I won't go. That was, I think, Stokely Carmichael's contribution to the anti-war <laughs> movement. Because we said we want to, and many young black men said, well, if I've got to die, I don't want to go die in some rice paddy in Vietnam. I might as well stay here and fight. So that was the era that I was a part of in the civil rights movement. Uh, now, I'm a grandmother. My oldest grandchild is 21. She is actually a Sudanese American. Her mother's Sudanese. My father is, um, her, my son is her father, and uh, she's a college student studying Chinese anatomy and quite a few other things. I'm very impressed. So maybe she's like my mother. Maybe she's on the brilliant spectrum. I sure I couldn't do either Chinese or anatomy. <laughs> but I have witnessed a wealth and participated in a wealth of challenges and experiences and joys and disappointments that I can reflect on. And I'm actually have been for quite some time. People say, have you ever finished that book? Uh, I've been working on a book for a very, very long time and it's called Memories of Love and War. And um, I've decided, oh, the first seven chapters have to go. That's too far back in time. So I have 21 chapters, actually I have 28, but I have 21 chapters and I'm coming to the end, but it is, it's true. That's what we remember the love and the war, the passion, the excitement, the danger. Uh, and we had, I had an, uh, quite a bit of that in my life. Uh, and I'm very happy. And I really do think I've been under some kind of special protection. I have no arrest record whatsoever. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> Maybe it happened because my father was connected to the State Department. Sometimes I wonder if that's it and it's not really angelic protection, but we'll see. Um, 50 years later, uh, then we had such a laser-like focus on our goals, we were the generation that said we wanted to change the world. We actually believed the world could be changed. We actually believed that we could go out and do things to change the world, and I watched people doing it. I watched the people going on the Freedom Riders. I watched those, I met some, these are people who are, to me, heroic, because they get on a bus and drive from Alabama try to get to Mississippi and the bus gets set on fire. I mean, but they were our heroes. They were people who did this. We admired them and they generated an excitement and they generated the possibility for other people to be able to think of what they could do. And that works. That's the way movements develop and when their leadership and the participants are genuine and they're committed and they're not out to make a buck and they're not out to because they're running for office. That is what gives inspiration and people are willing to join them. I did and many other people did. We were about changing the world. We had a very gruesome, and many of you here know exactly what I mean, a very gruesome Vietnam War that destroyed too many people. But the, one of the things I remember most about the war is the mothers who ran and said, my son is not going. I will take my son to Canada before he ever goes to Vietnam. Or, I will take my son here. Or, I will take my son there. So we had this element that was running for freedom and this element that was going to Vietnam and the warfare that this country was engaged in, I think it helped stimulate and inspire a level of I don't want to say extremism, but it, intense devotion to social change that we felt because so many people were dying, because the world was changing. When I saw the young women in Albany demonstrating, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do it. I was in a Quaker school because my father was in the Foreign Service and he was in Asia and Africa. When he was assigned to Liberia, I did my 10th grade uh, schooling in correspondence course. And then we moved on to Sierra Leone, a British colony, and they didn't even have a school because there were British schools that I could go to. I didn't go to school at all. I thought it was wonderful. Sierra Leone has gorgeous beaches. <laughs> and my parents had parties because they were diplomats. And 
they said, no, no, you have to go back to school. So I ended up going to George School. My parents were in Africa. So it's kind of odd to be a child in America with parents in Africa. And I was the only child because the, my brother had died. And so I got a lot of attention and I had an excellent, excellent inspiration, education in Quaker School, education in Oberlin College, education in Barnard College. And then I went into the Civil Rights Movement. And that's where I really, I told my father, you give me the money you spend to Barnard and I'll get a real education. He said, okay, I'll do it for a year. And I thought that was wonderful. I got a $125 check every month. I could pay the rent, I could buy food. And I didn't know how to drive. We didn't have a car in Snake. But so I was supporting my little cadre of four people in, in Atlanta. And there were three men from Alabama who I, one I grew up with, and one I was a graduate student. But we were like a collective, the uh, campus program. And what our job was is to go to the campuses and get people who were students back into the movement and bring your expertise and bring your knowledge and bring your special skills into this freedom struggle. And at the end of the year, he said, well, I've supported you for a year. Now you have to go back to college. I said, go back to college? I'm in the midst of a revolution. I can't go back to college. He said, well, I can't send you any more money. So I moved to California shortly after that. And Eldred Cleaver and I had met at a conference, a, a conference about, the, it was called Liberation Will Come From a Black Thing. SNCC had organized this. We had uh, sent out invitations to all the famous writers and activists that we could think of, wanted them to come to our conference called Liberation Will Come From a Black Thing. And guess what? It was over the Easter weekend, and there was a freak snowfall on the East Coast. Nobody from the East Coast could get a plane. We invited Eldridge Cleaver. He lived in San Francisco. They didn't have snow. He came, and he was our only speaker. Um, so I thought he rescued our conference. But when he came into the building where we were, we, we, we were told to get off the Fisk campus, we had to, a, a minister who had a church there said, you could use our church. So I was re retyping the agenda, rechanging, and they had picked up Eldridge Cleaver at the airport and brought him to the apartment where we were restructuring our conference uh, agenda. And <clears throat> he looked at me, and I looked up at him. He's a really, really, he's big like Muhammad Ali. And but he didn't have any expression in his face. What I learned that is, that's what they call a mask. Prisoners have a mask. They, they, they mask whatever they think and feel. And he'd been in prison for, he'd been, he had gotten out of prison three months before I met him. And I don't think I knew anybody who actually, I mean, I knew people who got busted and went to jail because they were protesting, but I don't think I knew anybody. I didn't even know what prison actually looked like. Well, I certainly learned after, after he and I got together. But, so it was, I didn't really know what kind of person that was. He had no expression on his face, but he, Basically, he looked at me and he fell madly in love with me, which I think makes no sense also. How can you look at somebody and fall in love with me? Well, he did it. <laughs> and so um, I was going to go back to Atlanta. And he came and he was talking to me. And I said, well, yeah, I've got to go back because I have to do this. And Fred Brooks, who's a student there, he said, he has to go to uh, Atlanta, too, and get some printing done. And we're going to go together. And he said, well, how are you getting going to get there and he said, well, such and such a professor, he has a car, he'll let me drive. Elder said, I have a car. You can drive my car. Oh, okay, that's cool. So, but he was on parole. He had absolutely no business leaving that state because his parole allowed him to go to Nashville and return. But he gave his car to Fred Brooks and rode in the back seat. Fred drove. We all went down to Atlanta. We got down there. He, had, he was paying a lot of attention to me. I don't think I actually noticed exactly. Anyway, we liked, I had learned how to play chess. We played chess, and I beat him. Now look, this doesn't make any sense. This man had been in prison nine years playing chess. I just learned. <laughs> so, but I won. So I said, did he do that? <clears throat> Would men do that? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, shortly after that, we fell madly in love. <laughs> uh, so um, I was in Atlanta, and now I was in the place, and I could do things like those girls in Albany, Georgia, who I saw. I never got arrested, 
But I was so impressed with them, and now I'm in SNCC. So I'm impressed with the people around me. We had absolutely no money, no salary. Why? Because when Stokely Carmichael came in, he called for black power, he called for this, he called for that, and much of the money that was set to support the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the kind that John, uh, John Lewis was the chairman of, uh, was gone. And so it was, we were becoming more and more radical and more and more revolutionary. Uh, the Vietnam War, the inspiration we gained from that huge uh, rise of independence in Africa, particularly the one that's the most impressive to my mother's generation was Patrice Lumumba. She talked about reading and hearing about the children in the Congo having their hands chopped off and the brutality. And the, here we see a black man kind of looked just like a whole lot of people in America, Patrice Lumumba. If he was walking down the street here, you'd not say, you, you wouldn't think he was a foreigner. <laughs> so Patrice Lumumba becomes the president of the Congo. That was mind boggling. I would think I was in ninth grade when that happened. Every African American that was conscious was impressed. That's the president of the Congo, particularly the Congo, because that was one of the favorite insults. I like to call up on some of the other names Congolese. That was an insult, along with a few others that you've heard of. So when the Congolese becomes the president, it was mind boggling. And then we saw Sekou Toure in his long white robes and Kwame Nkrumah. So the African liberation and African independence was huge in that era of inspiring us to change ourselves, change our expectations of ourselves and change the way we wanted people to look at us because we saw something absolutely phenomenal that our parents hadn't been able to see. Who had been able to see a black African head of state in a white robe go to the United Nations? I mean, that's just mind blowing for African Americans. Uh, while I was attending college in New York, my parents, I had dropped out of college the first year because a lot of things, mainly because it was in Ohio and it was freezing cold. It was a good college, but oh, it was awful. It was just awful to live in Ohio in the winter where somebody had been in Sierra Leone in West Africa. So I, I just couldn't handle it and I dropped out and my parents wanted me to go back to school and I was working in Washington doing stacking Peace Corps folders for the Peace Corps volunteers to take when they went out. Uh, and recruit the Peace Corps. So uh, one of my parents' friends said, I think you could do something better than that. And he worked for something called the Community Relations Service. He said, why don't you come over to the Community Relations Service and be my secretary? And I said, okay. His name was Dick Thornell. And what I would do is the, the Community Relations Services would go to cities where there had been what we call riots, and they would observe them, and they'd make reports. They didn't change anything. They'd just tell you what was happening. And my job was to type up the reports. I was typing all these reports and this and learning about things. And um, <clears throat> so the um, town that I'm from, Tuskegee, was one of the places very, very, very close to Montgomery. If anybody knows where Tuskegee is, it's 40 miles north, east, northwest of Montgomery. And the MIA, Montgomery Improvement Association, worked very carefully with the TIA, the Tuskegee Institute Improvement Association, and they collaborated, and Rosa Parks, who everyone's heard of, her hometown is not too far from Tuskegee, it's, further, it's closer to Tuskegee than to uh, Montgomery. So the, the environment in which I was growing up, and the environment my parents provided, and the environment of the Quaker school all coalesced to encourage. I had no, there's no obstacles to me wanting to be in the revolutionary movement. Everything says, this is right, this is what you do. That's what I did, uh, and I encourage other people to do it. Uh, one of the students who I worked with in, um, in Atlanta was a student at the veterinary medicine school, but he was also a black conscious person, and he published a newspaper at Tuskegee. Well, they didn't like that at all. They kicked him out. Uh, George Ware actually graduated, and the three of us ended up in New York, and that's where I got my real education with Men who've been in the civil rights movement, one was, uh, George was a chemist and Ernest was studying medicine 
and neither of those are subjects that I can have any, any participation in whatsoever. But I learned so much just listening to them. They're the ones that told me, let's read Ramparts. And that's where I discovered who Eldridge Cleaver was, because he had articles in Ramparts. And George brought this message, and I remember to this day, the cover. It was Madame Bien, the wife of the president of South Vietnam, just like a Michigan State cheerleader. <laughs> and they were talking about the relationship between Michigan State and funding and CIA, et cetera, and the Vietnam War. And so Ramparts was actually the magazine Eldridge Cleaver wrote for. And that's how I found out who he was. And that's how he ended up getting invited to our SNCC conference. And so these, this is an era in which all these elements and energies and people are flowing together to encourage and elevate the struggle for social justice, civil rights, freedom. It was a liberatory time. And I say that because that time is gone. I don't know if it's going to be reactivated. I don't know if we're going to have another upsurge like that, but it happens to coincide with the war in Vietnam. So that's a horrible, horrible way to get inspiration for social change. But that is what happened. Um, <clears throat> and I, I am eternally in debt to my comrades and friends who taught me, and I learned from them, just listen to them, what they had to say, what they did, how they understood what was going on. A uh, new organization came into being during this period of my life. I was in New York, but out in California, there were two men who had started a new organization, and they called it the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And Stokely Carmichael went out to California. He'd always go out there to raise money. It was a great place that people would help support the civil rights struggle. And he came back, and he had a scroll. And he said this scroll was given to him by I think he said, Bobby C.O. Huey Newton. Anyway, they said he could be the, um, from the East Coast, the uh, li leader of the liberation movement, because out in the West Coast it was the Panthers, but he was, you know, he was Mr. Black Power. And so the, we were engaging with each other, enjoying each other, and I have to say that these were actually brilliant. Stokely Carmichael was absolutely brilliant. Ivan O. Donaldson, who I worked for at State, he was brilliant. George Ware was, but I didn't think about it at the time. I mean, these were my buddies, these were <coughs> activists. So being inspired and working with people who are devoted, who are intelligent, who are encouraging, you can't help but learn, you can't help but be inspired. And you, you kind of get a sense of, what's the right word? It's empowering. For me, it was empowering. I was doing what was important. I was doing what was right. I was gonna make a difference. Not just me, I mean, this whole, collective of activists that I was in. When the Black Panther Party began, and this I think is important for young people to understand, it had two members, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale. Which one's gonna be the chairman? Which one's gonna be the minister of defense? They said, okay, we'll flip a coin. Bobby became the chairman, and Huey became the minister of defense, and it went on from there. The first person to join was a young man who was 16, 15, probably high school student named Bobby Hutton. And I say that only because after Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis, uh, and many of you would remember how many uprisings and riots and fires and things were going on all over the country, four days. And, and the police didn't stop it. Somebody gave them a, this is a hands-off time. Um, it showed the power and anger and hostility and love for Martin Luther King all mixed in with the hostility to racism. There was about 200 uprisings around. And there was kind of a hands off. They didn't arrest a whole lot of people. Washington DC, parts of Washington DC were just burnt. 14th Street, it was burnt. And so that, when those things happen, you know, just like if you know anything about the Battle of Algiers, which was a, one of our very, very favorite movies, which was about a, a one little cadre of freedom fighters inside Algiers who were fighting against the French. And it, the movie, how many of you have seen the Battle of Algiers? Two, three. Well, the movie begins and you see the French. Oh, they're so arrogant, they're so determined. They're gonna come in and crush this uprising of people that they have nothing in but contempt for. And we see the women who dress like Europeans and go put 
bombed in bars that soldiers frequent, and they blow up, and we saw this young boy. And so it was just, so, so, you know, it's the minorities, it's the weakless, the people who don't have any say-so that are the stars in the Battle of Algiers. And that movement, that country became independent. And I later on lived there. So we had a glorious notion of Algeria based on that movie. But when I got there, the war had ended, they were independent, and there was a lot of poverty, and I saw all kinds of people who had, uh, who were, what do you call it? <sighs> Wounded, who had suffered. It, it was, it was war-torn. The, there were still bullet holes in buildings. Uh, we ended up, Eldridge, Eldridge was uh, arrested in a gun battle two days after Mar Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis. And the gun bottle, battle, well, there were about eight people involved at the beginning, but it ended up with two caught in a house on a street in Oakland. And they went into the basement to hide, and they were shooting back and forth with the Oakland police who came and set up floodlights and everything. And it was just And I was waiting for him to come pick me up. At, we lived in San Francisco, and I didn't know how to drive. And so he told me that day, because King had been murdered, and people were very, very, very uh, distraught and angry and furious and wanted to do something. And he said, well, you have to, I didn't know how to drive. And so he said, well, I don't want you to, uh, I can't go back to San Francisco where we live, so you have to stay over here, and I'll get back in touch with you. So I stayed with a friend that I knew who lived in Berkeley. And I'm a heavy sleeper, and I, slept on her sofa, and the phone rang over and over and over, and I never heard it. The, there was a lawyer trying to tell me that Eldridge had been arrested in a shootout, and they'd taken him to the hospital in the prison. Uh, but eventually I woke up, and that was what I heard. Uh, and when I went to the jail to see him, I mean, he did look like a war casualty. He had bandages on his hair, he was limping. Uh, but I know that he was what I put it. Easiest way to say he was very proud that he had engaged the police, that he'd survived a battle with the old police. And this was in response, in response to what had happened to Martin Luther King. He said, we want to have this response. Other people, there were like about a hundred rising riots in the country at that time. So when you see that, when you're a part of that, you think the world is changing. Something is going on. This is not normal life. This is war. This will come this is where liberation will come for, from. So, <clears throat> and it's small. This is what I think people fail to understand, how small the movements begin. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense began with two people, Bobby Seale and Huey Newton. They wrote out their 10-point platform, their 10-point program, and actually, Bobby didn't even realize it. The day they did it was his birthday, because he went home, and there they had a surprise party, his brother, so, but they, they like, Bobby was a stand-up comedian, a carpenter, an engineer, a veteran, and he was an amazing organizer. And Huey was a law student. They had met at Merritt College. And so this is, these, are, these are people who, whose abilities and genius and passion were poured into a social change movement, a revolutionary movement. And that doesn't come without a lot of suffering and sacrifices, and some people go crazy. A, a, a lot of them go crazy, as a matter of fact. I mean, if you see all those Vietnam veterans that came back, uh, they were damaged. And so that's something you don't think about once you did commit to this movement. And a lot of people will think, like, I, I'll die for the struggle. Yeah, but no, you're going to live and suffer. You know, the people who die, that's short. Bobby Hutton was murdered. He was 17 years old. He was shot 16 bullets in his body. He was a teenager. <coughs> oh. But he was the first kid to join the Black Panther Party, and he was so excited to be with Eldred and be in this gun battle. Because this is, this is what? This is life. This is passion. This is committing to revolutionary struggle, committing to changing the world. Um, the Black Panther Party captured the imagination of many young people, and it, we had to follow behind people who were organizing They'll start, we're the Black Panther Party of New York. We're the Black Panther Party of San Diego. We're the, wait a minute, maybe send somebody over to straighten these guys out. Because people wanted to be a part of that. Why? Because it was liberatory, because it was exciting, because they had a sense that it meant something, that they were gonna do something, 
Ultimately, they were going to change the world sooner or later, one way or another. Eldridge had another slogan. He said, ready or not, here we come. Um, we were going through a crisis, but it was a crisis that was fascinating, it was passionate, and it did have an impact, I think, bigger than those of us who were right there understand. Um, I was giving a talk in Chicago, uh, some anniversary that I was invited to give a talk for, and I was talking about how we wanted to change the world. We wanted to change the world. And at the end of the talk, a woman in the audience who came up to me and she said, you did change the world. Well, I was pretty flabbergasted. It seemed to me the world changed itself back. But <laughs> at least there were some people who thought what we did changed the world. It also changed the vision of what kind of world we could have. And that's something that's very key for young people to have a vision of how the world could be different. Because if you don't see that, then why would you go out and risk your life and organize and spend money and, and, and you know, abandon school and anger your relatives to change this unless you think it really is fundamental and it really will happen. Emory Douglas, I think you may have something of Emory in your exhibit here, your Soul and Ice exhibit, which is phenomenal. I don't think any other place has an exhibit quite like this one. I know they don't. Uh, many places they don't <coughs> want to, uh, they don't want to be reminded of Elders Kluber. They don't want to be reminded of Soul. They don't want to hear about this. Why? I'm not quite sure why. I know there are a lot of people who do, but it, is it that it's controversial? Or is it that that struggle never was completed? And so if you bring it up, well, you know, people, oh, let me, let me start changing these photographs. How do I do this? <laughs> ah, this is the People's Republic of the Congo, Brazzaville, not Congo, Kinshasa. Congo Kinshasa was the one that Patrice Lumumba became the head of state, and Patrice Lumumba was murdered, and uh, lackeys of uh, the mineral industries kind of took over. No, it's not supposed to keep going. <laughs> oh, well, I guess it's going to. No, I thought you could do it one at a time. This is a national committee to combat fascism in North Carolina. Once the Black Panther Party became so radioactive, divorced because I went back to school to go, I was so impressed by Charles Gary and what he did to get people out of prison. I said, this man can walk people out of prison? Well, I want to know how to do that. He's a lawyer, I want to be a lawyer. And eventually, uh, sometime after this moment, I applied to go back to college. I applied to Yale and some other schools, I think Berkeley and Somewhere. But I really wanted to get away from California and Eldridge and be on my own, and I accepted. Uh, in I, I was accepted to go to Yale College, so I was in my 30s. I took my children and went there. And um, when I got to law school, well, ultimately, I discovered well, what Charles Gary did, he did not learn in law school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was a labor organizer before. He was an Armenian who knew exactly firsthand what discrimination was. His brothers kept their name, Garabedian. No, he said, I have to be different. He, I, I gotta compete with all the Jews in law school. I have to be better than all of them to get a job. And so he was Gary. And so uh, the, the, what do you call it, the mix of influences and activism and change, it's very illuminating, it's also very exhausting. And everybody doesn't have the stomach to put up with, but Charles Gary was one of those major change agents who he, he was essentially, not only was he revolutionary, he didn't have any children. And he kind of, I got the impression that he kind of looked on Huey Newton, his client, 
as a son. He was very devoted and very careful and very protective. And he, he, he won that case. I mean, when I say he's charged with murder, he was convicted of much lesser offense, and then he got out again. And so Charles Gary transformed what happened to the Black Panther Party. And I think what the happened to the Black Panther Party tra transformed Charles Gary. Because when he first came to work on the Panther case, on Huey Newton's murder case, he was very chic, beautiful suits, sleek hair. I mean, kind of like an actor, kind of Romanesque looking. You know, by the end of that, you carry with bent over, <laughs> hair was gray. Uh, it took a lot out of him, really did. It was a murder trial, but also it was his energy and fire and devotion and belief in what the Panthers were, were about. Because Gary actually was in the Progressive Party and he was an activist long before he became an attorney. Um, now, um, let's see, are we gonna get any Emory work in here? How do I do this? What do I do? This one? Yep. Which one? Which one? This one. The, the, the. Well, didn't get any more Emory. But this is after Eldridge decided we were living in France, four years in Algiers. The Algerians told us that Alger we were going to some big, I think it was Celebration of Independence. Big, big, huge government thing in a, in a stadium. And somebody walked up, up to us in the um, parking lot and he said, well, you know, uh, we're going to uh, probably, in a couple of years, we're going to resume diplomatic relations with the United States because of the oil industry. He said something to that effect, which is like letting you know, you're okay now, but this isn't permanent. Why? They nationalized Elf Oil. It was a French company. Well, you know, the French didn't care for that. But they needed the technology to develop their oil industry. Who has oil development, oil extracting technology? Who has the best? Americans. In fact, the very first day I arrived in Algeria, I had been in France and I had French uh, supporters who helped me figure out how to get from, I, I got from America to Britain, from Britain to Paris, and I was trying to figure out in Paris how to get to Algiers, and Richard Wright's daughter, Julia Wright, became very, very helpful, and so the, I, I she showed me how to do this and how to get here, and she could speak French, and she'd been in Algeria, and so she and her husband helped me get a flight, drove me to the airport. Uh, I got there late. Why? Why did I get there late? Because Eldridge is in Cuba. When I was trying to go to Cuba, I wanted to join him, and the way I could do it, you couldn't fly to Cuba from America. It was illegal. So in order to get to Cuba, what I had planned was to leave New York. I went to London, from London I went to Paris. From Paris I found out that I could get to Algiers, which is where one of the Aeroflot flights, it goes Moscow, Algiers, Havana. So I am about seven months pregnant. I wanna be where my husband is before uh, this baby is born. And so I was planning to go to Cuba. And I had bought clothes and I had trunks full of summer clothes and blah, 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 and I was gonna go to Havana. Uh, not that I knew anything about Havana, but that's where Elder was. And I get to, once I have a ticket to go to Algiers, I get a visit, not a visit, but this man named Lee Lockwood, he was a photographer who had been in, in, Cu in Cuba. He wrote a, he, he did photo books. Some, have you ever, anyone ever heard of Lee Lockwood, the photographer? Well, it was a long time ago, but he was a well-known photographer. And he was in Cuba and Eldridge met him and told him to get a message to me that when you get, when I go to Algeria, do not get a plane to Cuba. Stay there. And it was very important for him to tell me this because the Cubans and Eldridge had kind of had a parting of the ways. And he was on his way to Algeria without my knowing. But you can't communicate. You can't talk. You can't talk on the phone. You can't write a letter. The only way we could communicate was courier. Someone would go from the United States to Havana and they get messages or whatever. And so this Lee Lockwood had talked to Eldridge in Havana. He came to, he, he called San Francisco. Oh, Kathleen's not here, she went to New York. He called New York. Oh, she's not here, she went to Paris. He called Paris. Oh, yes, she's with my daughter, Julia. Uh, you know, this is when I'm actually just packing my suitcase to go to the airport to go to Algiers so I can get a plane to Cuba. And so he stops me, he says, I have a message. He walks up to me in the street. 
And this man with curly black hair and a seersucker suit and a camera. So I have to believe that he's who he says he is. So I guess so. I, I don't know. I don't know who. I mean, I know the name, but I'd never seen Lee Lockwood. And he says, I have a message for you from Eldred. Can we go sit down? So we said, yes, OK, let's go have something to, you know, have some tea or whatever. He says, when you get to Algiers, do not leave. Eldred is coming there. Oh, that's a big change. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> uh, 45 minutes before I get on the plane to go to Algeria, I get there. Emery Douglas, the artist Emery Douglas, is traveling with me because it doesn't make any sense for a seven-month pregnant woman to travel from you know California all the way to North Africa by herself. So Emery, I asked Emery, who's very good friends with Eldridge, to come with me, and so. I missed the flight because I met Lee Lockwood. So then I got a much later flight. It was like a midnight flight. And I get to the Algerian airport with Amy and Emery get there. And, you know, it's a, it's a military style uh, type of environment. The men in the uh, airport look like soldiers. They have on certain kind of uniforms. But they're really relaxed because it's midnight, you know, it was like the end of the day. and so. My friend Julia Wright, she's the daughter of Richard Wright, had given me the name of a hotel. So when you get to Algiers, you can go to the St. George Hotel. She didn't tell me the St. George was the most expensive hotel in Algiers. And I never heard of any other hotel, so that's where I went. And um, very interesting. We get up in the morning, go to have breakfast out on a terrace. And out on this terrace, there's another table. Who's sitting at that table? Texas oil men. They're talking to each other in their accents, blah, blah, blah. And I said, this is it's, it's, it's weird now looking back, because the American oil business was quite willing to take over from the French. And once that actually occurs full-fledged, they're not going to be able to continue to deny diplomatic relations with the United States. In fact, to sign a contract for the delivery of liquefied natural gas, which would be millions and millions and millions of dollars worth to, to, to Algiers' uh, oil industry. Uh, there was no American embassy there. So they needed some kind of security for the investment of the Americans. And what was going to happen is that sooner or later, the Americans would come back. But they had no diplomatic relations at that time because of the Six-Day War. Now, many of you never heard of it. And others have forgotten what the Six-Day War was. But the Six-Day War was a fight in Egypt, I believe. And the Algerians supported the Egyptians, and the Americans had supported the other side, Israel. And once that happened, Algeria broke off all diplomatic relations with the United States. So there was no one there. There was no one that was going to arrest us. But with the oil business coming in, that was going to change. And they wanted us to know that. Um, and I saw how they let us know it. Uh, we were having something called la liberation. In, 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 the, in the third world, they have celebrations of the day of liberation, liberation this, liberation that. Afro and the Cubans had a poster, Afro-American Liberation Day. And so we were having an event on African American Liberation Day at our headquarters in Algeria. And we'd sent out invitations, and people were coming. And guess what? Here come the police, turning people away. Our time had run out. They're letting us know. Uh, no, you don't have to leave, but you can't have no Liberation Day, so, you know. And so this was, a, this was the beginning of the exit. Later on, they called everybody together. By this time, we had maybe 15 people and families, children, et cetera as fugitives in Algiers. And um, they went to every house where we had either our office or someone was living there and, and confiscated all our weapons. And uh, so that's a clue. You know, it's about time for you to get ready to leave. Why? Because they want to get the oil business. They want to get the money. And the United States is going to spend an enormous amount of money on their oil business, oil development. And they know it. And now we see what it is. And it's also not like, no, we're not telling you to leave. You, you can stay, but we're not going to give you any money. We're not going to give you any passports. We're not going to help you. you know. So uh, ultimately, everybody figured out where to go. Some people went to Tanzania. Some people went to um, uh, Zimbabwe. Zambia, I'm sorry. Some people went to Zambia. Uh, a brother from New York named Sedoweo Tabor that lived there. His wife, Connie, 
was a British citizen. So we were a multinational, multi-ethnic group of African Americans and freedom fighters. And um, we had to disband. And when it was time to disband, Eldridge said, well, I've had enough of the Third World. I, I think I want to go to France. <laughs> I don't want to go further in Africa. And he, and he, as a writer, France is very romantic. It has appeal. So we, um, he had to go clandestinely. Um, now, he did go clandestinely. He had somebody drive him across the border and hide him in a house in southern France. And then he's up in, um, in Paris, walking around, and somebody that was in prison with him. Now, Eldridge Cleaver is six foot two, he's got orange, brown skin, slanted eyes, he's very tall. And he stands out in France, okay? Because most French people, I'm the height of a French man, you know? So, so somebody he'd been in prison with saw him in the, in the park in Paris, and he said, hey man, hey Eldridge, hey Eldridge Cleaver. He said, hey, I'm underground. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and eventually he couldn't take being underground. And he decided, and people thought he was nuts, and he thought all kinds of things. He decided he was going to surrender, and so he could come home. And that's after he had surrendered, and after he came home, and that's our son, and that's our daughter, and that picture is outside of his mother's house in Altadena, California. Because he, he said, I can't just be a black bump on the French log. And that's real. That's what people are about, about their lives, their families, et cetera. So he'd done as much as he could as a, as a what do you call it? The French weren't going to arrest him. So the Americans sent, he ne we negotiated with a man named Tom Togo West, who was in the State Department, that he could surrender. So he went to the American embassy, and they were going to arrange his travel. And he said, well, do you have any ID? He pulled out a San Francisco library card. <laughs> 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 he didn't have a passport. He didn't even have a valid driver's license. So I was thought his library card was his ID. Let me, uh, that might be one of those pictures. Let me see. I'll say. This, this one? Well, that's a freedom demonstration in San Francisco when Huey was up for and we're protesting, and I made those posters all the I would never saw it for the people. And so that has no signature. But if Emory, always sign it. So you know it's Emory. If it's unsigned, it's more than likely me. <laughs> um, so um, the war protest, the women's movement was expanding, calls for black liberation, the full-fledged enjoyment of human rights. All this was going on as I was growing up, as I was raising a family, as Eldridge was getting more and more, what's the right word? Discomfort, uncomfortable being left out there. And so when he um, came back, the way he came back alienated some of the people who like to look up to him as a revolutionary without taking into consideration, well, what does it feel like a man from California who never lived anywhere but California? I think he, moved, he lived in Arkansas, but then he came to California. That's all he knew, Arkansas and California. And he's in Paris. And he'd been in Algeria. And he'd traveled to Vietnam. And he'd done, that was, he wanted to be home. Um, and he turned himself in. And he lost a whole lot of friends, a whole lot of friends. But he did what he wanted to do, and then he became a born-again Christian, and that was the end of it. But the radical movement said, oh, no, we can't handle that one. Now I'm from the South. I mean, there's born-again Christians every time you turn around. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't see that as something to be denounced. But people in the West Coast and people in the Communist Party, and other, they thought that was just, just uh, uh, over the top. And he, so there, those, that, those sets of friends were no longer part of his life. And by this time, I was actually trying not to be part of his life. I wanted to go back to school, and I found out I could apply and go in January, which is really interesting, because you usually have to wait for September. So Yale had a new program. I applied to Yale. I got accepted, and I had to leave right away, because it was January. And I didn't even have time to, because to, I secretly applied. <laughs> and then I said, uh, I'm leaving. I'm taking my children. I'm moving to New Haven. and. He was very sad, but he had kind of gone off, uh, what do you call it, 
Borderline personality disorder, some of you know what that is. He'd gone to the other side of that one. <laughs> he was no longer, the, he, no longer the dynamic, exciting, passionate revolutionary. He was passive and quiet and withdrawn. And I had no idea, well, what, what happened? I, I, I mean, this is a disorder, but I never, I never saw that, and I didn't know, and people would call me and say, Kathleen, you have to leave. One of my best friends from Tuskegee said, you have to leave, do you understand? He's going crazy, he's gonna harm you. Hmm, really? Maybe that's true. Uh, so I went back to college, uh, and I moved to New Haven and took our children, and we, that was the end of our relationship in person, but then, I went to law school, and then I wanted to apply to take the bar exam. And in the bar exam application, you have to say your marital status. I said, I'm thinking this has to be true. You know, I can't, I can't say I am divorced, I'm not. I can't say that I'm not married, because I was. So I think what I did then was go meet this attorney named Elga Wasserman, and I said, I want to get a divorce, because I want to be able to fill out the application, honestly, to. Um, take this exam and be a lawyer. And so we kind of divorced by mail. Uh, and that was the end of a certain part of my life, but not really because we have children together. And my daughter would go out to California and see him. But he was becoming a very different kind of person, uh, more withdrawn, more sullen, and Probably full of regrets. I'm not sure, because I moved to Cali I mean, moved from California to Connecticut, and I never went back to California. I finished college. I finished law school. I worked in New York, and eventually, about 25 years ago, I went and I was hired at Emory Law School and moved down to Atlanta, and I'm I'm there. Uh, I don't regret anything really. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> it's all part of what makes. Life happened, and it's part of family, it's part of struggle. Uh, you don't get out here alive. You don't get out alive. <laughs> um, so I would say that the goals and the methods of those who are fighting in South America, who are fighting against colonialism in Africa, were inspiring and connected. African American black people, because of that being taunted and denounced and called Congolese and this. So the African liberation struggle was something we identified with, the movements for social justice we identified with, and the world, in fact, was changing. I don't think I really focused so much because I was trying to change my own life, but the world was changing. Liberation was the term that we used a few years ago I was asked to give a talk at the University of Chicago, and in my talk, I mentioned how, like I'm doing here, how much we wanted to change the world. And one lady came up after, and she was, I mean, she was younger than me, and she said, you did change the world, into the collective you. Wow. Some people actually think it was changed. Dare to struggle, dare to win was one of our slogans, and it is an era rich histories, rich legacies, a lot of which is suppressed. How many of you know who is Robert Williams? Right, one. Well, he's a historian probably, right? <laughs> Robert Williams lived in Monroe, North Carolina. He was a veteran, and he wrote a newspaper, and he, was, um, he created a rifle club in the NAACP, and he was teaching young men how to shoot. And I have a poster of uh, him. He's showing his wife how to shoot. He knew how to shoot, and he was a big guy, and he walked around He got run out of the country. He went to Cuba, and then he went to China. And eventually, he came back to live in Detroit. But nobody really knew who Robert Williams was. But Robert Williams had a book. It was called Negroes with Guns. It's about that big. And he talks about the struggle in Monroe, North Carolina, and how he was, had these gun clubs, and how he was challenging the violent racists in North Carolina. And, um, <laughs> Eldridge was passing out these books to all the Panthers. And one little small detail, I, I'm so impressed that I discovered my mother's sister, when she finished college, was looking for a job teaching. And someone had taken a job teaching uh, high school, I believe, in Monroe, North Carolina. This is in the 1930s or 40s. My aunt is about five foot one, very petite. 
and, but there was a job. And so the lady who left, why did she leave? Because of the Klan, it's insane up there. And my aunt went and took that job. That was her first job. And I said, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know she had it, you know. So we discover connections both that are political and social and family that are all about change, development, empowerment. And it seems that perhaps enthusiasm for such kind of change may his down, I think we have to take into full consideration what they call the drug wars. The drug wars are against young black men. The drug wars are imprisoning mass, mass imprisonment of young black men. That didn't begin until the 70s. When we were growing, around, growing up, it, was, it wasn't that much difference. You did this crime, you go to jail. But it got to the point where a whole lot of black boys are going to jail. A lot of them. This is after Bush comes in. Eldridge called it bushwhacking. That's what's happening. Um, so what I'm going to conclude is that we can't return to that past, but, but we can study it, we can learn from it, learn from the victories, learn from the defeats, the successes, and understand what the goals for black liberation, women's liberation, social justice, human rights were. That's what's important. What were the goals? What did you expect to do? Who did it? How did they do it? Read the books. There's so many books out there that people who are part of these movements have written, but I think a lot of them are overlooked. Uh, particularly if it's about Panthers. I mean, when the Panthers write the books. I have a whole bookcase full of books about or by Panthers. But that's not what you call the bestseller. If it's a bestseller, it has another quality to it. So I said that my father was a sociologist. Many, many, many times he would say that the America, the way America will become a just society is when everybody is brown. And that's what he thought was going to happen in the future. So we're all going to be a little more brown, and then we'll have a different dynamic. Uh, he'd worked in the elevation of poor farmers. He'd worked for the TBA Association. He'd worked in the voting rights movement in Texas. He became a foreign service officer in India and the Philippines and West Africa. He was a real smart guy. Maybe he was right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>